halls and the rotundas, and then at lunch into Statuary Hall. All the walls, the ceilings, the windows, the very air evokes the story of the United States as a nation. And all but four of the retiring presidents have attended the swearing-in ceremonies of their successors. They'll hold for a minute so that the organizers get this right down to the last minute. There is, by the way, despite occasional conventional wisdom, no requirement in the Constitution that this be held precisely at noon. They've actually been running a bit behind this morning. The only thing that the Constitution requires is the actual oath of office. Various members of the Senate and House leadership have come up in those two limousines. Congressman Dick Army, the big heavy set one, and there on the west facade are all those people who have the most privileged seats, including Joe Lieberman, who, as most of the country knows, was, one could say, smart enough now Though he was criticized at the time to not give up his Senate seat in Connecticut when he signed on as Al Gore's vice president, talking to John Kerry, his neighbor there from Massachusetts. All of the people coming to this place, which is more than any other place, a sign that the union is going to continue. Now, this is Liz Cheney, who is Dick Cheney's daughter, and behind her, Mr. Cheney's other daughter, Mary. They came to the fore at the convention uh, for the first time, and I think that's a bush behind them. It'll take a while for the country to become familiar with all of the bushes, but over there on the left, you'll get to see him lots of times. We come, there he is, right on the left-hand side of the car, George P., um, who you also heard at the convention, uh, become something of a very popular character with the young people in the country. That's his mother, George P.'s mother there. He's doing, there's Jeb Bush, the governor of Florida, who many people, of course, thought would be the political runner in the family after his father and who must have had some pretty hellish days during the 36 days in the post-election period. Senator Bob Dole, the ubiquitous Senator Dole, he's been everywhere today and appears to enjoy his retirement and who left the Senate of the United States in more graceful fashion, I think, than many others before him have done with his wife Elizabeth who we said may be able to become the new UN ambassador and there's a face from the past of course that was Tom Foley the former speaker of the House of Representatives George Herbert Walker Bush and Mrs. Bush who continues to be one of the most popular of all former first ladies but who some people regard as maybe the toughest political mind in the Bush family. Certainly the one who remembers all of the favors and all of the slights. And with their grandparents are the two girls, Jenna and Barbara, named for their grandparents. They're getting a lot of attention. The President-elect told Barbara Bush in an interview she did down at Crawford just the other day, General Powell and talking to Jimmy Carter, the country does know these two characters. But it was interesting to hear Mr. Bush tell Barbara Walters in no uncertain terms, Barbara, that he does not want these girls to get the kind of scrutiny that other members of the family he recognizes have to have, and he'll hold people to it if they do. Jenna Bush, who is uh, uh, quite lively and uh, goes to the University of Texas, and this is the one thing he feels very strongly about. It was the only time in the interview that he really got uh, almost angry, and he said, I'm fair game. 
uh, my wife is semi fair game, and uh, Laura Bush said, no, I'm not. And he sort of let that go, and he said, but I will not let anyone. And he talked about how he agonized when he had to make his decision to run uh, for president, and the agony was over what it would do to his two daughters. Well, I have to tell you, they're getting a lot of attention. There's even a website. I think it's called Twin Sisters Stuff. Dot com. I suppose we shouldn't be in the business of advertising websites, but it's been quite fascinating to watch on, on this twinsisterstuff.com the fascination that other twins around the country and around the world have with the fact that they are twins. Fraternal and you realize that there is yet one more bond um, between individuals who are actually twins. Sam Donaldson, you have, made, you have been there for so many of these walks. Your turn. Well, Peter, when you talked about Jimmy Carter, we all remember 1981, this very, very tense situation right on inaugural day. The hostages were in their airplanes, you recall, at the airport in Tehran. And the question was, Jimmy Carter and his people have negotiated for days and days, when would they be released? And when Jimmy Carter, the outgoing president, walked down these steps, uh, I said to him, are the hostages free yet? He said, I can't say that yet. And, and the, the anguish in his face. And of course, as you recall, once uh, Ronald Reagan was sworn in, they were released. And Barbara Bush. Well, Ted Koppel, you remember some of that same tension? You and I were deeply engaged in the whole business of the hostage release. Do you recall your feelings at the time? Oh, I do indeed, Peter. I mean, it's, uh, it's curious to think that it's been 20 years. You, as I think you mentioned at the outset, where were you? Were you over in Frankfurt at I that was in, point? I was in Frankfurt you waiting in, for them to arrive. Right. And, and the whole country had been seized for 444 days, as we now know, by the capture of those uh, 52 American hostages, diplomats, a couple of uh, intelligence agents. Uh, who were held in Tehran, and it was an agonizing night, this last night and, and the last morning of Jimmy Carter's administration, because he was up almost the entire night working in the Oval Office with his advisors and wanted so desperately to bring about the release of those hostages, and the Iranians were just as determined, as you remember, not to let that happen. And to be sure, uh, we later found out that they were actually in telephone contact with some Iranian sympathizers here in Washington who were on the phone with them, and they waited quite literally until the moment that Ronald Reagan raised his hand, took the oath, and as the, as the power transferred from one president to the next, that plane was allowed to take off. Uh, it was an extraordinary time. And there's some extraordinary moments here as well to Barbara Bush and Rosalind Carter greeting another and Jimmy Carter seeing George Herbert Walker Bush. What an extraordinary moment for George Herbert Walker Bush. This hasn't happened since the 19th century for a father to sit there and watch his son inaugurated. Jeb Bush was walking along the streets here the other day and said he could hardly wait to see the look on his father's face. And there are the twins, of course, who, a little hard to tell how averse they are to being in the public eye. They've stayed very much out of it. And Chelsea Clinton, who I think it's almost universally agreed, has had a very, very healthy development from a child into a young woman during the time that her parents spend at the White House. She came back, uh, as you know, when Mrs. Clinton was campaigning for the Senate, she came back and joined her father on some of the last official trips and, and occasions. A very, very significantly developed young woman in this particular period, and I think it could probably be argued that one of the reasons was the respect that the press gave her. Clintons do not like the press, particularly. George Stephanopoulos helped me on this one. I don't think the Clintons have ever liked the press very much. I'm not sure the Bushes do either. Uh, not yet. In fact, um, when Barbara Bush was talking to Mrs. Clinton, when she first came in as first lady, that was the first warning she gave uh, to Mrs. Bush, she, to Mrs. Clinton. She said, watch out for the press. I think it's kind of an occupational hazard with any president. They develop a strong distaste for the press. But as you point out, Peter, they were fiercely protected of Chelsea Clinton in those first few years at the White House, not only from the press, but from the staff, from everyone. They wanted her to have a normal life. And it was only when she chose to start coming out more, basically in her father's 1996 campaign, that she started to play a more public role. And as you point out as well, the press was always respectful of that. 
the modern press be, may be more voracious, but it has always been us, as, as historians remind us time and again, when the, this American couple enters the White House, they become the object of attention in every, every imaginable way. Their outward face to the country, we want to know about their inner thinking, and there's some great debate always going on within us as a country as how close and how intimate we wish to be with our presidents, what is presidential, what is not, and yet it seems to me that on an occasion like this, Ted Koppel, that we want to see as much as we can. We do. I'm, I'm glad you came to me, Peter, at this moment, because I was just thinking about something that, that George Bush the elder said at one point, and he Ladies clearly and at that time did the not think lady, that his son would become, uh, would become president of the and United the States. But he was asked, what are you most proud of? And he thought for a moment, and then he said, I'm most proud of the fact that the kids still come home. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Mrs. Bush, uh, Barbara Bush, also has this, this wonderful... Uh, sort of straightforward notion of what is important in life may be a good thing to mention as we watch this transition of power take place. And she said, I don't know of anybody who's ever been lying in a hospital or lying on their deathbed who said, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. They all talk about maybe wishing that they had spent a little more time with their families. Uh, and, and this extraordinary, what, what strikes me is to see Jimmy and Rosalind Carter standing there uh, and you know, not just another couple of people standing there in the crowd, but power transfers in this country from one group to the next. Mrs. Bush in her peacock blue, Mrs. Cheney in tan. I think we resolved that, the color, as long as we have the microphone, I think is probably the issue. But Cokie Roberts inside. Cokie, you've got a better, closer look at the rest of us, and you know this transition being a child of politics better than all of us, I think. That's true, Peter. In fact, I was counting back. I found a picture of myself on somebody's shoulders in 1949 at Harry Truman's inauguration. I don't remember it, I have to tell you. But uh, these, these transitions really are moments. And I'm sitting looking at Tipper Gore and walk down there. How hard this has to be. Uh, thinking that, that this she, she should have been there is probably what she's thinking. But also knowing that this is this is the role that she has to play. I just think the combination of the history and the personal poignancy is so great on a day like this that there's no way of overstating it. We all expect our politicians to smile on public occasions, practically on cue. But, Koki, do you think that Tipper Gore will go into this retirement period, whether it's extended permanent or not, with greater ease than Vice President Gore? Yes, because I think she's a person who's very comfortable in herself. And uh, she has causes that she cares deeply about, uh, particularly mental health. And uh, she is very involved in them and will stay very involved. I think for Vice President Gore, he has really been either in public life or aspiring to public life most of his life. And that uh, he's got a lot of, of soul searching to do about what he does next but he's very smart he has lots of inner resources uh, but uh, this is going to be very hard look at the ladies i'm apologized Koki. i don't know who the woman in red is well let's see i have to stand in a different place for me to be able to see who the woman in red is she may simply be an official. I, I think she may just be an official. There's no such thing as just an official, I grant you. I think she may be an age. She's yes, that, that she is, the, apparently she is an age uh, in the Senate. Okay. That's Elaine Chow in there, who is the wife of Senator Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, and she is the Secretary of Labor designee. The Marine Band, always, always, always in our background. The, no other band in the United States so associated with public occasions as this, sometimes known as the President's Own. Played at every inauguration since Thomas Jefferson's in 1801. He gave them the title, the Marine's Own. Perhaps we can just listen.